Welcome to the Workplace Wellbeing Essentials Series. I'm Mari Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Advancing Wellness. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this expert interview where we explore topics that impact employee well-being. My guest today is Dr. Dale Atkins. Dr. Dr. Atkins is a licensed psychologist, an author, and a speaker. She has more than 40 years of experience as a relationship expert focusing on families, wellness, managing stress, and living a balanced, meaningful life. She's also the author of this fabulous book called The Kindness Advantage, Cultivating Compassionate and Connected Children, Everyday Ideas for Raising Kids Who Care. Welcome, Dale. I'm so delighted to have you here. Mari, thank you. It's my pleasure, my pleasure to be with you today. This is great. So this book is kind of interesting in that it's written for children, for parents, and it's about creating compassionate and connected children. And we know that the research shows that connections and social engagement are key to successful, fulfilling lives. And yet we have never been more disconnected or less connected than we are now. So connection is also one of the elements that we use in the well-being model that, um, that we refer to in our work. And I'd love to spend our time together exploring this relationship between kindness and connection. And even though you've written this book for, child, for parents and children, certainly there's a relationship to the workplace. So let's explore this a little bit. Let's start, start with why kindness is so important in our life. Well, kindness is so important in our life because we are social beings and we need to be connected. And when we are connected, we want to respond and we want to be responded to by the people around us. So it's really part of the way we're wired mm -hmm. to be empathetic, to be kind, to be compassionate. And what we like to think of is we have everyday opportunities to be kind and to be compassionate. And we just want to help people look through a lens of kindness. I say we because I co-authored that book with Amanda Salzauer. And we did quite a lot of research. And a lot of it showed that even children as young as three months old respond when other people are kind to them or when they feel that someone else is in distress. Mm -hmm. They prefer mm -hmm. people who are kind to those who are not. They prefer helpers to hinderers. And yes, we did write the book for parents and grandparents of young children. But what we've noted mm -hmm. is that everywhere we speak, yeah. people want to be able to generalize these principles to the workplace and their everyday life. So we are social beings. We need to be connected. And you're right, we've never been less connected, but we have ways to ensure that we stay connected because it is who we are as human beings. Excellent, excellent, I love that, love that definition. How is kindness linked to our well-being? In many ways. First of all, and I think the most important, is kindness gives our life meaning and purpose mm. and a sense of fulfillment. So. When we are kind to others, and by the way, it isn't only to other people. It's kind to the environment. Mm -hmm. It's kind to animals. Mm -hmm. It's kind to mm -hmm. ourselves. But let's talk about being kind to others. When we are kind to others, we get a release of endorphins in our brain. And it's almost like a mild morphine high. And it has come to be known as the helper's high. So we get this flood of endorphins which makes us feel good, and it also gives us the impetus to do more kind deeds. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, the recipient of our kindness also wants to do more good and more mm -hmm. kind things. And even if you're watching someone do a kind deed, you can also experience this flood of endorphins. So in that regard, it's wonderful for our emotional and our mental health and our well-being in the way we look at the world. We start to look at the world through that lens of kindness more positively. Additionally, 
it's been shown in many, many research studies, both for children and adults, that our physical health improves when we are kind. Kindness is linked to happiness. And so when we're happy, we also feel better. We have a better attitude. Mm -hmm. We are, as I said before, more positive. But there are some significant studies that link to blood pressure, to reducing blood pressure, to happier hearts, to just an all-around general feeling of enhanced well-being. And we, in the book, we talk quite a little bit about that, um, the, the particular physical responses that people get when they're kind. Hmm, that's wonderful. The other thing, yeah. the other thing, by the way, is our social relationships are better because when you, when you try to be kind and you want to be kind, you connect, going back to your first question, you connect mm -hmm. with people. You develop a relationship, even, Mari, if it's just a relationship with someone you may not see again, that momentary relationship, the person who gives you your coffee, the person who mm -hmm. helps bag your groceries, mm -hmm. the person you hold the door for, when you make eye contact, when you say thank you, when you say have a good day, or gee, you're looking springy today. These kinds of encounters help us to feel better as they help other people to feel better. You know, it's so interesting to, to hear how simple that really is. And yes. if everyone were doing this every day, what a different world we would live in. It's so true. You know, all of us were probably raised with some form of the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would like people to do unto you. If we tried to really live our lives that way and asked ourselves that question from the moment we got up, how would I like mm -hmm. someone to treat me today? How can I treat someone that way? Mm -hmm. And where will I find the opportunities to do that? I think that you're right. Our world would be a much different mm -hmm. place and we would monitor what we say, we would connect in a very different way, and most importantly, we would be role models for our children, our teenagers, people in the workplace. People watch us all the time, right. and we are always on display. So why not be a model for being kind? I love it. Let's talk a little bit. I'm curious about, let's take this into the workplace setting. I'm curious oh, yes. as to what, it, what does a culture of kindness look like in a workplace? A culture of kindness in the workplace looks like there are people who like coming to work. There are people who enjoy the people they're working with. They respect the people they work with, and they feel that they are respected. It looks mm -hmm. like the people who are there are recognized for who they are. They're not cogs in a wheel. They're joined together for a collaborative environment, in a collaborative environment, perhaps on a collaborative project, but they are all motivated to work towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. And that, again, reinforces that feeling of connection. A kind workplace looks good. You know, people walk in and they say, wow, there's something about the energy in this place that mm -hmm. feels welcoming. It feels affirming. It feels positive. It's a workplace that helps by mentoring and wants people to mentor and be mentored. It's a workplace where people are very often, not just once a year at their review, but very often reminded of why their contribution is meaningful and what they did specifically and what it is about them with their uniqueness that brought something special to the completion of this project or that made it easier for others who might have been out and they really brought up the slack. Mm -hmm. And the recognition is not just from managers, which is important. Mm -hmm. The recognition is from peers. Peer recognition is so unbelievably valuable, especially when people are working from home, when they're not necessarily in the same physical place, so that their peers are constantly keeping them engaged, that we are all feeling a part of something instead of apart from something. That recognition, the uniqueness, wanting people to bring their whole self into the office mm -hmm. and recognizing that we don't have to be totally conforming. Yes, we have a goal, 
but we all are achieving this goal in our own unique way. I love it. I'm curious what you might suggest to employers to do and what actions can they take if they wanted to create a culture of kindness in their workplace? There's a magnificent neuropsychologist who works out of the University of Wisconsin. His name is Richie Davidson. Mm -hmm. He's most known for his studies in meditation and monitoring the brains of meditating monks. One of the things that he talks about now is well-being in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I think that people who are leaders in businesses and in work really have a lot to learn from what his studies show us. Mm -hmm. He wants and he suggests that we remember four key elements of well-being in the workplace. One of them is resilience. How, mm-hmm. and I'm going to take the, am I going to answer your question from the perspective of the employer or the manager? Right. How can we encourage resiliency in our workers? How do we help them to recover and learn from mistakes that they made? Um, are we chastising? Are we punitive? Or are we encouraging and using it as an opportunity to help them learn from the situation and then help them kind of recover, right? Because when we're resilient, we go back in. We're not scared and we don't shy away from something. We say, okay, this is what I did last time. I know I can do it again, but I'm going to do it differently. The second is to have a positive outlook. And what we know is that people who are kind to others generally have a more positive outlook about other people. They're less suspicious. And so the employer wants to try and build a trustworthy environment, Mm -hmm. a collaborative environment, a less transactional and more relational environment so that it's not just what can you do for me and what can I do for you, but how can we together build a relationship that will last a while and that we can learn about each other and trust that when you say you're going to get me something by Friday at noon, I know that I can depend on that. And if you're not going to do it, you're going to let me know beforehand and you're going to say, this is, this is what I need from you. So we have trust building in those relationships and we're positive. The others have to do with focused attention. As an employer, try to have, and this is really hard, the least distracting environment because with all the pings and the dings and the interruptions, it's hard for workers to maintain a thought and to try and follow a thought. So if we're constantly being interrupted, And if we're expected to respond to this email immediately as soon as it comes in or a text, when really we're working on something and need to be creative, we have to give our workers an opportunity to have the space they need to do their work. Mm -hmm. And then the whole idea of generosity, and I spoke about that a little before, be generous, be appreciative, and lead from the top as far as being a role model. Learn how to control your own emotions in a positive way. Give positive feedback, not drive-by rec- drive recognition, you know, but stand with someone and say, this is why what you did makes such a difference. I think that employers have a tremendous, tremendous opportunity mm-hmm. and a tremendous responsibility to be the model that they want to have. And when they notice that there is pro- a problem among the workers to try and deal with it in a positive way Mm -hmm. and to not let bullying and undermining and undercutting and all of these kinds of behaviors become the norm and have them not be acceptable, whether it's people feeling uncomfortable because of language that's used Mm -hmm. or certain kinds of jokes or whatever it is. An environment where people are comfortable is an environment and and respected and recognized is an environment where workers are motivated. Well, it's so consistent with the approach that I take and the work that I do with organizations. And it sounds like, you know, the purpose and the values that drive that organization are all part of, you know, really, you know, what it takes to create that type of wonderful workplace. And who wouldn't want to work in a place like what you just described? So that's certainly, I hope we can impact the um, people to think differently about what goes on in their workplace and try to make some changes that would make it a much kinder, gentler workplace. It also affects the bottom line. And that's what so many business people want to know that people who are happier at work produce better and they are more efficient and they are less likely to be worried 
about what's going on. They are less likely to be distracted and shopping online when they're at, when they're at their work because right. their attention is focused. Well, absolutely sounds like it would benefit everyone and certainly not just the individual well-being of the people, but the well-being of the organization as well. Mari, I have one more thing that came to mind, if I sure. may. Yeah. And it has to do with what employers can do. Um, they can encourage people to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. They can encourage it not only in the workplace, but also outside of the workplace. Uh, one of the things that I really encourage employers to do is during lunchtime or, or perhaps early or later, but mostly during lunchtime, to have lunch and learn meetings. Mm -hmm. And they can poll their employees and see what are the things that you're most interested in, in learning about and how can we provide that opportunity. And for 45 minutes, people have a chance to take off their work hat and put on their, you know, adult child of an aging parent hat and learn about that, or parenting with kindness, or learning about some insurance thing that they need to know, whatever it is, or how to maximize their, their, um, you know, their sleep, or how to maximize their workout, and to really encourage people to be healthy in and out of work, and to change what's going on near the coffee machine, and also offer some healthy snacks, and encourage people to really be their best selves and their whole selves. Uh, you know, the Cleveland Clinic has a great model for how they are encouraging people to be healthy. They go to where and to stop smoking, and they go to where the people are, and they take it from there. And I think that again, encouraging a healthy workplace with workers who are encouraged to be kind to themselves, to take off the time they need to, to be the people they are in the rest of their lives so that they can come to work as fully integrated, healthy human beings. All great suggestions, thank you. And very, again, consistent with the awareness and education programs that we encourage employers to offer. Dale, great. if our audience wants to learn more about you, how can they get in touch with you? Well, Amanda Salzauer and I, who wrote the book, have a book website, and it's uh, www.thekindnessadvantagebook.com. And then I have my own website, which is uh, drdaleatkins.com. And I welcome people getting in touch and asking questions and sharing their stories about what works in their workplaces and what works with the kindness in their lives and how it's changed them. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today, Dale. This is just such a lovely conversation. And thanks for all you are doing to bring more kindness into the world. Mari, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Take good care.